earliest man-made objects that we know of are tools used by our ancestors for cutting. Scientists working in Africa have found cutting stones that date back over two and a half million years. About 4,000 years ago, we learned how to separate iron from the other elements in iron ore, and sword and knife making became part of the metal worker's art. By the Middle Ages, people in Europe were carrying short swords and daggers around and bringing them to the table to cut food and spirit, very much as we use a fork today. And in the first years of the 1600s, we see the introduction of knives that were designed for specific use in the kitchen and at the dinner table. Knives are probably the single most important tool for a good cook. A professional chef will use whatever pots and pans are available in a kitchen, but they all carry their own set of knives. A set of knives is actually called a wardrobe of knives, in which knives go into your wardrobe and be as personal as what you put into your clothing wardrobe. There are, however, a few basics that should be in every cutlery collection. The most important is the chef's knife, which is also called the cook's knife. Its primary use is for chopping. The knife blade rapidly and repeatedly strikes the surface of a chopping board, cutting to smithereens any food in its path. The proper grip for a chef's knife is really very simple. You take the last three fingers of your hand and slide it up behind the bolster point. The bolster point is right here. It's the connective part between the blade and the handle. Slide it right up there and put your index finger on one side of the blade and your thumb on the other side of the blade. That's it. You rock the knife handle up and down with one hand while the fingers of your other hand rest lightly on the top. Just rock the blade up and back on top of whatever it is that you are chopping or mincing. As the food spreads out on the cutting surface, bring it back together and continue chopping. Sometimes you need a chopping technique with greater impact. In that case, hold the knife parallel to the work surface with its cutting edge raised slightly up. Lower the knife firmly and raise it slightly several times in rapid succession. For some foods, a slight forward slicing motion can be helpful. The two things that I use a chef's knife for most often are chopping onions and mincing garlic. And there are a few little tips that can make both of those tasks easier. First of all, when it comes to onions, when the blade of your knife cuts through the cell walls of an onion, it releases an acid into the air. And it is the fumes of that acid that makes your eyes tear. The only thing that really works well to reduce that problem is to put your onion into the refrigerator for 10 minutes before you start slicing. Colder gas molecules move slower. To slice an onion, cut it in half through the root. Place the flat side down on the cutting surface. Cut off the front and the back and peel it. Hold the onion with the tips of your fingers. Move your hand forward so the tips of your fingers are tucked under the first joint. Rest the side of the blade against the section of your finger that runs from the first to the second joint. The knife stays against the front of your fingers and slides down to make a cut. The knife comes up staying against your fingers. Your hand goes back exposing more of the onion and the knife comes down to make its next cut. The distance that your hand moves back determines the thickness of your onion slice. And that's the technique you use for slicing most fruits and vegetables. Just make sure those fingertips are tucked under. To chop an onion, cut vertical slices up to but not including the root. The knife goes down and back at the same time in what is really a slicing motion. Then the knife is held horizontally and horizontal slices are made in the onion from top to bottom. Once again, up to, but not including the root end. The final step is to cut down across the onion so you end up with little squares. If you want the pieces to be smaller, you just give them some additional chopping with the rocking technique. With parsley, you start by bringing the parsley together into a ball. Then slice the ball until you have small pieces. And once again, Finish it off with a rocking motion. Okay, that's how you handle the parsley. Very simple. Next, the garlic. Take the garlic and place the bulb flat on your surface. Then take the palm of your hand and give it a shot. That'll open it up. Then take apart the individual cloves, cut off the ends, 
Bang the side of the blade against the garlic clove to loosen the skin. Then peel off the skin. Place the side of the blade over the garlic and give the blade another shot with the base of your fist. That should crush the garlic. Then complete the process by rocking the blade. This is a common technique used by many professional chefs, but remember, you're hitting the blade of a knife with your hand, so be careful and pay attention to what's happening. Let me go over that again. A chef's knife is primarily used for cutting foods into small cubes, slicing, and mincing. The technique for cubing is first a set of vertical cuts, then horizontal cuts, and finally slices down from the top. Onion, squash, carrots, it's basically the same system. There's also a close-in slicing motion, like the one we used for parsley, and finally, the rocking mince. Before we go on to the next knife, let's take a look at the different parts that make up a knife. There are four main parts to the knife. The blade, the bolster, where the blade joins the handle, the handle, and the tang, which you can't always see from the outside, but is the part of the blade that goes into the center of the handle and holds one to the other. A well-balanced knife is important, particularly a chef's knife. If your knife is not properly balanced, it will be much harder to use. Instead of being able to just rock it up and back over the food at the balance point, you will find yourself lifting it each time. And considering how you use a chef's knife, that's not a lot of fun. The bolster is the back of the end of the blade. By placing the major portion of your grip behind the bolster, your hand is protected from sliding up against the blade. A smooth and comfortable bolster is very important. Your finger rests up against it for long periods of time, so you don't want any rough or uncomfortable areas. The tang inside the handle anchors the blade to the handle. A properly weighted tang is important for good balance. As for the blade, the most important point is the quality of the metal. You want a metal that will not stain or rust. The best metal will also take a good edge, and most importantly, it will hold that edge. You won't end up sharpening your knife a dozen times during each use. And by the way, a sharp knife is not only important for proper technique, it also appears to be important for safety. A few years ago, a study came in showing that most people who cut themselves on kitchen knives did so because the knife was dull and they ended up using it improperly in order to try and make it work. I'll show you how to sharpen a knife in a few minutes, but first let's take a look at a few more basic knives. Next up is the paring knife. A paring knife looks very much like a chef's knife, but smaller. The major difference in design, however, is in the curve of the blade. The paring knife does not have the pronounced curve that you find in a chef's knife, and that's because a paring knife is really not used as an impact tool. Of course, you could use it to chop a little parsley or some garlic, but a paring knife is intended to work as an extension of your hand. Your hand goes up on the handle so that your thumb is on one side of the blade nearest you, and your index finger is curved against the opposite side of the blade. The heel of your hand rests on the top of the handle. This grip will allow your entire hand to swivel from the wrist and gives you control over the tip of the blade as well as the edge. You can move the knife towards you to dig the tip into a potato and scoop out the eye, or away from you so you can scrape a carrot. By using a grip that foreshortens the blade, you'll balance the knife for easy work. With your thumb on the blade, you will feel the resistance of the blade scraping against the food, and you'll be able to sense what is happening. It's important to feel the food when you work in close with a small knife. This is what is meant when a paring knife is described as acting as an extension of your hand. Next is an eight inch bread knife with a serrated blade. A serrated blade has a cutting edge that is made up of a wave that is formed in two successive processes. First, the scalloped profile is cut out from the metal blank. And the metal along each cutout is thinned sharply by hollow grinding. This method virtually scoops out the metal to form a shallow hollow. It was developed during the early years of the 20th century for use on straight razors. It's the ideal method for putting a very thin, sharp edge on a thicker blade. Serrated knives are perfect for cutting things that are hard on the outside and soft on the inside. 
You want to be able to cut through the tough outside surface without crushing the soft inside. Breads, tomatoes, citrus fruits. A serrated knife is perfect for these jobs. In addition to the eight inch serrated bread knife, Henkel makes a five inch utility knife with a serrated edge. And it's really very handy. Quick slice of a lemon, piece of French bread, slicing a bagel. It's the kind of knife that doesn't fall into the official list, but you end up really enjoying it. Years ago, I was taught how to look at an old painting or drawing of people eating a roast at a table and tell how important each eater was within the group. When a chicken or other animal is roasted whole, a decision has to be made as to who gets which pieces. There are only two breasts, two wings, two thighs. And clearly, the diner who gets the neck is less important than the person who gets the breast meat. The people who did the carving at these ancient banquets were very important. They had to know just who was who and where that person stood in the social system. In a royal household, the carver of meat was a person of considerable power and prestige. Even today, in the formal meals that we have at Thanksgiving or other important family gatherings, if there is a whole roast, the carving is usually given over to the head of the household, and it is often done in public at the dinner table. The tool that takes the terror out of this situation is the slicing knife, which is also called a carving knife. These are intended to cut through cooked meats of every kind. The knife has a thin, flexible blade. The steel is very strong. And trueness of line and absolute straightness is essential. The most common use of the slicing knife is probably on a turkey. So here's how it's done. Start by slicing off the legs. It's a good idea to let the bird rest for 20 minutes after it comes out of the oven. That'll let the juices of the bird come together before you start slicing. Separate the thigh bone from the leg bone. Slice the meat on the leg behind the drumstick. Transfer the drumstick and the sliced meat to a serving plate. Slice off the wings. At this point, you go to slice the breast meat. There are two techniques for slicing turkey breasts. The first is to just start slicing from the outside in. Slice it thinly until you get to the breast bone. The second approach, which is the one that I prefer, is to start at the breast bone in the very center of the bird and cut the entire breast away from the carcass. Lay the breast flat on a cutting surface and slice the meat from back to front. Then transfer the sliced breast meat to the platter. That's it. This is a six inch utility knife. It's really somewhere between a small chef's knife and a large paring knife. I use it for fruits and vegetables, peeling a pineapple, cutting carrots. It's a utility infielder on an all-star level. For many people, it's the knife that they end up using most often. And this is a boning knife, which on the face of it sounds like something you don't do at home very often. True, boning meat or poultry is not a common task. The reality, however, is that this is a valuable knife with an unfortunate name. A boning knife is ideal for removing all of the visible fat from meat and poultry, which is something that many people do on a regular basis. It's also perfect for cutting a stuffing pocket into a piece of meat or poultry, which is a particularly nice way of making a simple dish more interesting and tasty. And finally, a rather recent addition to the Henkel's line, the Santoku. This is an Asian chef's knife. They use it on meat, fish, and poultry. It's an interesting variation on the European model, and for many people, easier to hold. That's what most professionals and good home cooks would consider a complete wardrobe of knives. A chef's knife, a paring knife, a large serrated knife, a slicing and carving knife, a six inch utility knife, and a boning knife, plus my own edition of the five inch serrated utility knife and a sontoku for a change of pace. So now that you have them, how do you care for them? Caring for quality cutlery has three aspects. Keeping them sharp, keeping them clean, and storing them properly. It's not so much the cutting through food that dulls a blade. The real dulling comes from the impact of the knife's cutting edge against the firm surface of the chopping block or cutting board. Steel also tends to shrink back into itself. 
So if you are about to work with a knife that was sharp when you put it away, if you haven't used it for a while, it might not be sharp any longer. It's always a good idea to touch up the edge of a knife before and after you use it. The hardness of the metal in a knife is measured on something called the Rockwell scale. The higher the number given to the metal, the harder the knife is. You can only sharpen a knife if the tool that you are using to do the sharpening is at least eight degrees harder than the knife that you are trying to sharpen. Since the Rockwell number is not marked on a knife, the only way to make sure that you are using a proper sharpening tool is to buy the sharpener recommended by the company that made the knife. I have seen people who have bought a set of good knives and a sharpener from some other company which was not as hard as the knives. Every time they used the sharpening tool, they were actually sharpening the tool, not the knife. So I assume that you have the proper Henkel sharpener for your knives, and here's how you use it. Place the steel at a right angle to your cutting board with the tip of the steel touching the board. Get a good grip on the handle. Place the back of the blade just in front of the bolster point against the sharpening steel. The angle between the blade and the steel should be about 10 to 20 degrees. The pressure of the knife against the steel should be very gentle, and the tip of the blade should be pointing up slightly. Then slide the blade down toward the board, pulling it back towards you as it slides down. Keep the pressure against the sharpener light, and try and hold on to that 10 to 20 degree angle. When you get to the bottom of the steel, you should be at the tip of the blade. That's it, four or five strokes like that on each side of the blade, and your edge should be back in shape. The best way to clean a top quality knife is to wash it with a wet soapy cloth or sponge right after you use it. Rinse it under warm water and then dry it. All the materials that make up a Henkel's knife are dishwasher safe, but it's just not a good idea to put a good knife into a dishwashing machine. The knife gets banged around, which is not good for the blade, and the temperature change in the water is not good for the steel. A knife like this should last a lifetime if you care for it properly, so why not care for it properly? It's easy. And when it comes to storing a knife, the best place is in a knife block. Each knife is kept separate and safe. They won't bang against each other and chip the way they do in a drawer, and there's no chance of dropping off, which can happen with a magnetic rack. And when you put your knives in a knife block, if the block is slanted, put them in blade side up. That will help keep them sharp. Now at some point in time, a really intelligent person decided to take two knives and join them together in the center. It doesn't sound very interesting until you realize that the result was the first scissor. So it's only logical that a serious knife company like Henkel's would make a serious scissor. Actually, it's called a kitchen shears. They're made from top quality steel that has been ice hardened to prevent staining. The shape has been designed so they cut along the entire length of the cutting edge right up to the tip. There's a steel insert in the handle for opening screw caps, and most amazing, there is a screw in the center that allows you to take the shears apart for sharpening. And finally, I'd like to say a few words about what makes the Henkel's brand so special. On June 13, 1731, the Henkel's family registered their twin trademark with the Cutlery Guild in Soling, Germany. In 1771, J.A. Henkel's gave his name to the company, and it was in 1867 that they opened up their own steelworks. Their standards were so high that only by actually making their own steel could they get the quality that they were after. At the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago, Henkel's won the award for cutlery excellence, and they have been winning awards for their excellence ever since. One of the main reasons that Henkel's has been the leader in quality cutlery is their history of technical innovation. During the 30s, they invented a system of ice-hardening cutlery. It carries the trademark Friador. Friador knives were harder, held a better edge longer, and had greater no-stain properties. Since the 80s, Henkel's has been using the most advanced computer technology to evaluate its products and to continually update design and production. In 1992, they introduced a new method of manufacturing called Sintermetal Component Technology, or SCT. SCT was being used by one of Germany's leading manufacturers 
of high-performance automobiles to produce a number of highly stressed parts for its cars. And Henkels realized that the technology could be adapted and that the adaptation would result in a major advance in the production of cutlery. For many years, the best way to manufacture a knife was from a single piece of forged steel. The same metal that formed the blade also formed the bolster and the tang. The forged metal was considered to be the best quality. But there were some compromises. Because the entire knife was made from the same piece of metal, you were unable to adjust for differences in function within the knife. The metal that made the best blade was not the metal that made the best bolster or the best tang. The ideal knife would be made from three different alloys. One for the blade, one for the bolster, and a third for the tang. But no one had figured out how to do that successfully until the invention of SCT. The blade needs a metal that is balanced for hardness, sharpness, and corrosion resistance. The bolster needs high corrosion resistance and strength, has no need for hardness or sharpness. The tang needs the highest corrosion resistance of all three parts, but there is no need to be concerned with hardness or sharpness. With SCT, Henkels could design a knife with increasing corrosion resistance from the tip of the blade to the end of the tang, and a decrease in hardness from the blade to the tang. The bolster needs a steel that would take and hold a very precise shape. It needs to be very strong and extremely resistant to stains. It took Henkels five years to develop the technology and the machine that would properly join these three metals together. The technology is so reliable that it was used to construct one of the main bridges in the German city of Cologne. To make sure that their new knives produced the results that their engineers wanted, they had them tested by the Stanford Research Institute in California. They tested the strength of the blade, and they tested the ability of the entire knife to withstand corrosion. At the key point, the bolster, the results were quite extraordinary. The bolster fits its handle with virtually seamless precision, which is extremely important in terms of food hygiene. This is the spot where food tends to get lodged in a knife to transfer bacteria from one food to another. The SCT system holds everything together so tightly that the entire Henkel's knife can actually be sterilized. Microphotography was used to prove that the blade had the most uniform edge ever produced and laser tests were used to further prove the point. On standard cutting tests, which set knives up to cut through 250 blocks of 10 layers of manila paper, the SCT knives stayed sharper longer. Henkel's SCT knives stayed sharper longer through the entire test. Henkel's also undertook extensive testing with both professional chefs and home cooks. I purchased my first Henkel knife in 1969 when I was living in Switzerland. The brand was suggested to me by one of the chefs in a leading local restaurant. That knife is still in top condition and in daily use. Unfortunately, not in my kitchen. One of my sons borrowed it, but I'm not complaining. I'm just not putting my new Henkel's SCTs up for loan. They will pass to my kids in my will, and that's it. I hope you enjoy using these knives as much as I do.